analysis of that. Obviously, there are a lot of things that get tried, but we should do our best to try and evaluate how effective those different interventions were, because ultimately, we want to be making good decisions. And Marion, for scientists like you, how much of your life has been taken over by researching COVID? Essentially, since February 2020. I personally have been doing COVID myself since then, so yeah, massive. So is it, is it a very different life from the life you were living, I don't know, two years ago? Yeah, it's definitely more hectic and it's more at the interface of science and what you can do with science. This is also what I feel is, is our responsibility nowadays. You need evidence for almost every question that we have and how to control this disease. And we are there to help. And Danny, as a, as a doctor in intensive care, your working life must really have changed. And I, I want to talk to you a bit about that. Thinking back to those early days of hospital admissions with patients with COVID, at that time, you must have been desperate to find any treatment that would help. Yes, we were. Intensive care had never faced anything like this before. We had a disease that we didn't know how to treat, and all we had to offer were intensive care supportive treatments. And the evidence coming from China at the time was that we probably needed more intensive care supportive treatments that we actually had within the UK. So a lot of people were very nervous about how we were going to cope with the large numbers of patients we were expecting to come into intensive care. And how quickly were you able to make progress in, in working out how to treat the sickest patients of all? I think initially we reverted to what we knew about people who had severe disease developments. And we started to try and treat it as if it was a simple case of viral pneumonia. And then I think the very moment, probably within about a month, we realised that COVID was different. And it didn't just affect the lungs, it affected many other systems in the body, of which the most obvious was around the incidence of blood clots. And this must have been a really hard time for, for you and, and the rest of your staff when you're living through the pandemic in your own lives as well as trying to treat patients. We were in a bubble just seeing patients all the time in intensive care, trying to share all the knowledge that we had. And it was almost like the rest of the world outside didn't really exist. I don't remember thinking very much about anything until June, really. And how quickly were hospitals rearranged to try to prevent infections from spreading within hospital? Very, very quickly. So before COVID even came in significant numbers to the UK, we'd already done a lot of planning at that point. So for example, in England, we were asked to identify how many intensive care beds we had, and we had about 4,300. And we were asked to identify how we could double the number of those beds, and then have plans in place for going up to 16,000 beds if we needed to. And I guess it's easy to forget how little we knew about the disease back then. At the start, I can remember doctors telling me that although they were using PPE whenever they were with patients, in the canteen, they weren't wearing masks or distancing because it was assumed if, if you weren't with patients, that was okay, which, which now sort of seems extraordinary. Yes, and looking back on that, it, it does seem very, very bizarre. And probably what infection did occur amongst hospital staff in those early days was coming in relation to the handover and shift changes rather than actually being acquired from patients. And we're talking today about trying out different ideas. Were there innovations which were tried and then abandoned? Yes, I think one of the things that sticks in my mind was because a lot of the viral pneumonia was a condition called ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, we thought that we needed to manage the lung problems of COVID in the same way to make sure that that person was given a lot of diuretics, so that's drugs to keep water off the lungs and keep them dry and dehydrated but again very quickly we realised that that was causing a, a higher incidence of kidney injuries and so we changed very rapidly into thinking more holistically about balancing what was going on in the lungs with what was going on in the heart and the kidneys and the other organ systems. Now we had a question from a listener Adrian Abbotts who lives in Scotland and he wants to know what's happened to the idea of using convalescent plasma that you get from the blood of people who've had COVID and then recovered as a treatment for COVID. What happened to that, Danny? That has had some history in relation to being used in previous epidemics in the Ebola and MERS, for example, and it is still used in some viral illnesses um, like chickenpox. And again, one of the, the wonderful 
wonderful things about the UK intensive care medicine community is we've been able to do a piece of research that's demonstrated that there is no benefit of that. So it doesn't make any difference to you once you've come to intensive care. There's still a little bit of a suggestion from the US that perhaps if you first get diagnosed there may be some benefit of having a convalescent plasma. But the difficulties with we haven't got COVID plasma to give to everybody, so we don't really know who might benefit. And we heard last month from the evidence about the trials which were up and running very quickly, which have discovered which drugs do and don't work and have saved many, many thousands of lives around the world. But some medications have remained controversial and one is the drug widely used to treat parasitic diseases, ivermectin. It's been given to patients with COVID in some countries in Latin America and on social media huge debates are continuing about whether or not it's effective. Now Letitia in the UK asked us about what happened to the idea of using it more widely and we had this question too. Hello, I'm Gillian from Pathetica. Whatever happened to using ivermectin as a protection from COVID-19? I read that trials have shown it not to be effective. It is used by many people here. It actually seems to be slightly anti-inflammatory. It will reduce the efficacy of the vaccine. Thank you. So Matt, there is a lot of misinformation out there about this particular treatment. So let's first look at the evidence and what we do know. Ivermectin is very effective in treating certain diseases, isn't it? That's right. So it's, it's used very widely for some of what are referred to as neglected tropical diseases, things like lymphatic filariasis that, that leads to alphabetiasis. And it's also very widely used in veterinary medicine for uh, treating and preventing uh, parasitic infections like heart flu. So where did the idea come from for using it for COVID, which of course is not caused by a parasite? So I think it comes from a, a, a number of different places. Partly I think that it's anecdotal when it's available and people are able to access it and take it and they use it to either treat or prevent COVID and they have a, a positive experience even if the medication wasn't playing a, any kind of actual role in, in treating or preventing the disease it, it makes it appear as if it is and so that can sort of lead to the hypothesis that it's effective. The other reason is that it has been shown in laboratory studies to have some antiviral properties and therefore the, the hypothesis being it may actually be effective in human studies. So there have been some trials, what have they found? So the evidence around this has been very mixed. There's the number of studies, depending on how you count it, from 14 to 20 different trials that have actually looked a little bit for preventing COVID, but much more in terms of treating. And there was a very, very recent Cochrane review that came out. This is the body that does some of the big uh, systematic reviews where they review all of the evidence. And what they found was there's no good evidence to conclude that the drug is in fact effective either for treatment or prevention. And that largely has to do with the fact that most of the studies were small studies and they weren't of sufficiently high quality such that we could really make it any kind of determination as to whether or not the medication is in fact effective. And Danny, ivermectin is now part of a large trial being conducted at the University of Oxford. Do you think we'll get a definitive answer one day to whether it does or doesn't work? I think one of the things that's really important about the COVID pandemic is the influence of research and the engagement of people, both medical and obviously the wider public, in the need for enrolling patients in research. And that's a very positive development. Yes, and this new large trial is going to be looking at people in the community. So rather than hospitals seeing whether it makes a difference early on, it'll be interesting to see what's found there.